I'm Kirsten Mangers. I'm Managing Director of Chick Labs, and you're watching Eye on Business. I'm Chris Placell, founder of Red Knight Consulting, and you are watching Eye on Business. Good evening, this is David Friedman with a special edition of Eye on Business. Uh, tonight I'm privileged to have four executives from technology companies. And we're going to talk about a very interesting subject called how to make technology simple to understand, not only for potential customers, but also for the investing community. Let me introduce you to our distinguished guests. We have Kieran Foley, CEO of Immersive Entertainment. Next to him is Ross Brodsky, COO of ICS Software. Gary Struder is co-founder and CEO of Invista Technologies. And on my direct right, Kevin McDonald, who is EVP and CISO for Albaca Networks. And I want to start with a very interesting question since we're talking about simplicity. What the heck is a CISO? <laughs> um, well, it's a good question. Uh, it depends on the company, but Chief Information Security Officer. My fundamental role at the company um, is to design and manage the information protection program effectively. But I also do that as a fractional CISO for other companies. So they hire me to come in in a part-time basis and to run their uh, computer information security program as well. Okay, you all get that, right? Okay, I'm glad. <laughs> so here's the question. Um, I want you to all think about talking in tweets, okay? I want you to talk about not necessarily 140 characters, but short answers. I want to see how easy it is for you to explain the kind of technology that you're involved in. Okay, I'm going to start with you, Carol. We're experts in creating living worlds for virtual reality software experiences. Okay, I want to ask the three other panelists, did you get that? Absolutely. Yes. Okay, you're a little hesitant there, Ross. That uh, was a pretty nice answer. Okay, good. All right, let's go to yours, which is very different now. It's ICS. Right. Uh, we create uh, software for a law int intelligence community and law enforcement that allows them to get critical information by any means necessary. All right, so if I'm now looking at this uh, technology for law enforcement, um, I can think about a variety of different technologies. I can think about robots, I can think about shields. What kind of software and why is it different than what's out there today? Uh, well, the, the, the kind of software we develop is essentially commercialized spyware. And uh, the difference to, uh, with everything out there today is the quality and level of features that we have. Okay. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to Gary who's also in the similar business, uh, which is cyber security. Tell me about what Invista does and offers. Well, to keep it down to your 140 character uh, type of a, uh, specification, uh, we basically let you determine what devices can access your accounts and networks. And if it's not a device that you've approved and added to your uh, registration, then they simply can't get into your information no matter whether they have your password, driver's license number, uh, username, doesn't matter. Okay. Now I'm going to go in order for a specific reason, so I don't want to leave Kevin out. And I want you to I want to ask you, what is Albaca Networks and what's unique about them? Who do they compete with and what's unique about them versus somebody else? Well, I'd like to say we compete with perception more than anything else because we do have a really unique set of talents and we have a... Perception, the company of perception, perception in reality. Perception in the market. Uh, um, so a lot of what goes on in the computer security and computer systems management industry are people using the same words of vernacular all the time even though they aren't um, naturally equivalent to each other. So there's a lot of people saying we're a managed service provider, we're a security service provider, we're a consultant, when in truth 
it's a couple of guys in a trunk and or maybe five or six, ten people. Um, we have a very advanced network operations center here in Irvine that's staffed 24-7, 365 with domestic talent. We're not using India-based talent. Um, we've been in business 34 years and we do um, everything from your small to mid-sized business consulting, come in, do an assessment, fix the network, manage and secure it, all the way up to very large enterprises to some of the largest hospitals in Orange County, for example, rely on us for systems management. Okay, now I want you to think about a case where somebody came to you with a very complicated technology over the last year. What was the best way they were able to describe, and you're all technologists, so it may be a little more difficult, but put, you, put yourself in the shoes of somebody not as technical as you all. I'd like to take that if you don't mind. Um, Gary's a perfect example. So I recently moderated a panel where Gary was on it, and as part of that I had to do the research. Uh, and I went to Gary's website, and I have to tell you, within the first two sentences or three sentences in his website, he had done a very good job of articulating that we are a hardware DNA system that makes a, takes a picture of a particular set of hardware. If that hardware is not what tries to access the system, it can't access the system, right? Absolutely. Very simple explanation. Right. One of the best explanations of a complex technology I've seen in a long time. So one of the things that you are telling me is that, we're telling our audience, is that a visual representation or a picture in somebody's mind is literally worth a thousand words. Yeah, it certainly can be. All right, so when I look at your software, Ross, and you're looking at, you know, ICS, and you're talking about law enforcement, what's a good way to represent your software? How would you describe it in a very visual image? So one thing we did, we actually uh, hired a comic artist to put together a three-page comic explaining how this would work. Uh, another way, what we did for the defensive product, we put together a one-minute video. Uh, when you look at that, you get a very clear picture of what we do. All right. I think it's one of the best ways. So I understand we have that video ready right. to queue up. Right. All right. right. So let's take a quick look at it, and let's see if it does its job. All right? Okay, great. All right, let's roll the camera. We constantly face cybersecurity threats while online. Millions of users try various security systems and antivirus software. Some have better protection, some worse. How do you totally protect yourself? Here is LevelNet. It is a network of collective information security. Each user gets protection regardless of their security system and capabilities. The LevelNet app traces the exact moment of the attack and notifies other users about it. All users receive information about an attack detected on one of its members and immediately the system protects them from the threat. Participants on the net communicate in real time as well as protect themselves and others. All LevelNet users get preventive security systems in a single solution. Fast and efficient information security on their devices. The automatic and prompt exchange of information between users in real time leads to the effective protection of all at the same time. LevelNet. The security of one is the security of all. All right, now that to me makes sense because when I first heard it, I wasn't sure of what it did, but I always like most people are visual. Okay, so to me it makes sense and being in, you know, a techie as well, you know, I like to see visual representations. So I, I like that. So when we look at immersive, now I've seen the uh, demonstrations of immersive entertainment. I was going down the Colorado River and I was being attacked by Indians, at least the system you set up for me. Uh, tell me about virtual reality and how you're able to make that understandable vis-a-vis -vis other technologies that are out there today. So what we try to do is, is liken it, uh, tell a story with it, first of all, and liken the technology to something the user is already familiar with. Um, but that's really important because you can get lost in the vernacular. Mm -hmm. uh, so usually, what, you know, shorthand for what we're doing is the Star Trek holodeck. You know, we're, we're, we're not bringing you an experience that we're fabricating. We're not taking a video of the Grand Canyon. But we're going to give you a plane ticket to arrive there and do what you want in it. Does it come with an actual plane ticket so I can see <laughs> if you're correct? <laughs> Just put on the HMD or the head-mounted display. And you're right. there. I'll yeah. buy that part. Yeah. So let's now think about... Um, a scenario. You've given your pitch before what you all did. Okay, we talked about visual, um, you know, a, visu a visualization of what you do. Okay, 
And I now want you to think that you met Ashton Kutcher, who's a, an angel investor and an actor as well. Not necessarily a techie, but fairly savvy. And I want you, Gary, to explain to Ashton at a cocktail party what you do so he'll give you money. Well, the first thing I do is say, have you been hacked? No, you're talking to... No, here, Ashton, here's Ashton right Ashton, here. Ashton, have you been hacked? And the answer is probably going to be yes. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you complete control over the hardware that can access your data. We're going to pull this DNA, we're going to store it, and we're going to match it every time someone tries to get into your, your data. And if it's not a match to the hardware that you authorized, they don't get in. Ashton, I'm sure you've seen uh, a lot of celebrities who have tweets posted that didn't come from them. It's just not that hard. And that can come from any phone, from anybody, if they've got your your uh, Twitter information. So that's why we believe that you should give us some money. All right, now I'm going to switch it around from making technology simple. Sometimes people buy it because they understand the technology or, you know, appreciate it. Um, sometimes they buy based upon the persona of the person giving that pitch, right? Yes. So how do you, Ross, make it clear that the, tech, the team is equally as important in making this technology relevant to the people that they're trying to sell to or the investors they're trying to get money from? Uh, I would highlight uh, that our team is very unique and uh, there hasn't been a company similar to ours in U.S. in a long time. Uh, it's been a very, very difficult product. Not a lot of people took that challenge. So I think that our team was able to do it, and we are in a you know, huge $80 million, $80 billion market, uh, and that would be a very good opportunity. Okay. And when you look at the market and you look at the, um, the team, there's always this, this question in people's mind, what is it like? You know, if, if you're trying to explain something very different, they're going to try to find an analog or they're going to try to find a competitor. So, Karen, how do you explain who your competitors are? You know, it's interesting. We, we explain where we fit within the marketplace, within the context of, of potential competitors. So, uh, we really talk about differentiation, um, you know, what we're trying to do relative to everyone else. Right now, VR and, and AR, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality, are relatively new industries. So, you're not seeing a, a lot of direct competition yet, except in a couple of different areas. One in uh, narrative, sort of Hollywood-style uh, storytelling, and another in the gaming industry. Uh, we kind of fit between those two. We're doing something quite different. So it, it's actually easier for us than perhaps others. Okay. Gary, how would you, uh, what would be your comments to that? Well, you know, we've, we've looked at, at this thing from a lot of different angles, and we've tried to make it as simple as it can be because in every one of our chosen markets, we end up dealing with endpoint computers. And endpoint computers, endpoint phones, devices, are always run by an individual. A lot of those individuals are very good at what they do, but that mm -hmm. may not be technology oriented. Mm -hmm. So we have a very complex system under the hood, but we've worked really, really hard to bring it down to something that people can understand. <clears throat> they don't have to know how it works. They just need to know that it does work. So you're telling me like storytelling or some kind of an example would make it more relevant to them. Oh, absolutely, and that example certainly exists. Uh, there was a Gallup study in late 2014. 63% of Americans said that uh, identity theft and digital fraud was the number one crime threat that would affect them in the next year. Okay. 63%. That, people are very aware of the problem. I think, I think the anecdotal examples um, by providing real-world comparisons. So, for example, when people say, what is a computer network? I like to say it's the freeway your data travels on. What's a computer application? It's the car that creates the vehicle that allows the data right. to drive. So you can use very basic anecdotes to explain very complex uh, terminology. And it does help people to immediately, um, you know, get the concept. So firewall, for example, what does it do? It's a firewall. It stops data from coming into that network. You don't want people you don't want in. 
and you only make the holes in that firewall that allow the data you want to pass. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. And that's very visual. Yes. Yeah. yeah for sure. us, it's similar as well. I mean, we, we talk about, I think it was uh, Hamlet who said, you know, nothing is either good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. <laughs> Same thing for us, right? What we're designing is, you know, we're not designing for Oculus Rift or HTC Vive, we're designing for the human brain. So I think when you're trying to explain something difficult um, to an audience, you have to understand their point of view, their context, to be able to relate that to them because uh, complexity is in the eye of the beholder. All right, so let's stay on the customer. I'm a big fan of a thing called customer jujitsu. Really understanding what that customer wants and reframing what you have and what your concepts and technology are to make it easy for them yes. to understand. How do you get the information from the customer? So for us, um, the crux of what we do is influence. It happens to be influence in the virtual world, but it's influence. And there is a direct correlation between being able to wield influence within any environment and ROI for a wide range of customers. So we try to bring everything down to that, that element. Okay, so we got influence, okay. Ross. Well, we were very lucky in, in a very initially, uh, we got uh, information that used to be private and from very, very deep um, customer, customer information from a leak from our competitors, no, almost no longer in business. So we're able to judge exactly what the market needs are down to customer service support level email. So we know what exactly the market is and what the customer needs are. Right. And I know you have very unique customers right. anyway. No, we have very unique customers. Right, okay, Gary? Well, we're very fortunate in that people understand the problem that we're trying to address. Uh, every day you pick up the newspaper and you find somebody else that's been hacked or you're a digital information has been put out on the web, your identity has been compromised, uh, you get your credit report has been damaged because of all of this. So, you know, people know that it exists. The, the challenge for us is to get the solution to them in such a manner that they will actually use it. Right. It makes no, if it's so complicated that they can't understand it, they'll put it aside, I guarantee you. They simply will disable it and not use it. So it has to fit the average person who's got some technology background, at least in being able to use the devices, but doesn't want it to dominate his life. It's just part of what it is. But the result is that their information and their data and their digital life is now secure. Okay. So I think there's two, two components to that answer. There's the macro customer, which is the market. So we have to understand what does the market need. That generally comes from what are the breach trends, what are the most recent crimes, um, who's the target demographic for those crimes. That helps us understand the, the high-level client. But then when it comes to the new client um, or the client that comes in and becomes specific, now we have to gain trust. And one of the things that we've done is I'm heavily involved as an appointed uh, advisor to the Sheriff's Department. And I'm part of uh, the LA FBI's InfraGuard and the, the electronics uh, Crimes Task Force with Secret Service, and that creates a trust level that allows you to say, look, I understand what's going on, I understand how comfortable you are. Why don't you share what's going on in your in your network with me or what's going on in your right. or what are you concerned about? And really get into the depths of, as a person or as a executive or whoever you're speaking to, depending. Um, what is it that it bothers you the most and what's your pain of today? Um, and I think it does begin to start a dialogue. If they say they don't have any, then I can start asking probative questions, of course. And everybody has a problem with security. It's, it's basically an unknown okay. It's a known thing. So let me, let me try to reframe what, what we've heard. And then what I want to do is go back to Ashton Kutcher for a second. I want you to go take a, you don't all have to do this, but maybe you want to try another approach to Ashton and see if he gets money. I mean, he's sitting out there just waiting to dole out funds to you guys. So we've heard about making complex simple. We heard about visualization. We heard about comparison to competition and analog where somebody can say, here's what we have versus something else. Uh, good storytelling, anecdotal information, uh, the method of influence, the character and the trustworthiness of the uh, management team, and gaining trust that what you're telling people makes sense and it's credible. Okay? Now, you're in an elevator with Ashton Kutcher. He's going to take you up because he wants to write that check. Okay? Remember, he's not a techie using any of these parameters. Who wants to take a shot at telling Ashton Kutcher in 15 to 20 seconds what he's going to buy when he buys your company or product? 
I'd be happy to do it. Go for it. If you want to do Okay. So uh, I would be, Ashton, good to meet you. And um, we're going to go up there today and we're going to have a conversation about the fact that many of your friends, high net worth individuals, have probably had problems with their phone being hacked from someone trying to steal their photographs uh, or invading their privacy. We as a company begin to understand the way they operate and we understand how it is to be a celebrity and we help you protect that information. Okay. And if I'm Ashton, I'm going to play it back. I'm Ashton Kutcher. And I'm going to say, how are you going to do that? I get what you're saying. I want to know how. So the first thing we do is assess your use of technology. We find out what it is that you need to do and that you like to do every day and what type of technology you're using to do that. And then we wrap our services around that in a way that, depending on the technology, there's a variety of different protective services and consultation. Much of it may be a training on how you do things or don't do things. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we can help you with that. So one of the other things that just happened is that when you, it was interesting enough for Ashton to say, tell me more. Mm -hmm. So you always want to put that little hook out there to try to get somebody to tell you more. Then you can be your techie selves. Yeah, you can draw, you can, you know, gesticulate or whatever. And don't use acronym soup. That's probably the number yeah. one thing. Don't, I like that one too. All right, who wants to take another shot at Ashton? I, I think I'd ask questions. So, so. Um, All right, I'm Ashton Kutcher. Ask yeah. me. So, right now, are you interested in, in exploring um, fully CGI VR? Are you in making investments in virtual reality at the moment? And um, the answer is either yes, I've made investments, mm -hmm. or no, I'm not interested at all. What if right. what if I said I'm not interested? That's all right. Then he's probably not a fit. Ah, uh, that's an interesting yeah. one. I wouldn't give up. Yeah, it's it's not. It's interesting because in in an industry like um, virtual reality, it's so new. You wouldn't necessarily give up, but you also wouldn't try to badger the person. You know, I, I think the the, um, the elevator pitch is one of those fantasies we all have, yep. right? But but the reality of it is is relationship based. And having just been through a funding round, um, this is a process, especially when it comes to funding and influence, as we talked about earlier, where you really try to develop a relationship. So it's a little more complex. So that. it's interesting. So the question then is, is there really a perfect elevator pitch? No. No. No I more than there is a I perfect person. I got two no's. No. 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 I don't think so. Uh, on the I agree with you, by the way. I don't think there is one because I think it has to refer, uh, reflect the individual's perception, the way he wants to hear it, and the interest level. And you have and to match their personality, and you yeah. have to match and, the way and, they listen. And, and all of which have to do with context, which also is a very important element in explaining context. complex and difficult concepts. Yeah. Tell so me more about context. You have to really come from where the listener is coming from to be able to explain things to them. And there, there is going to be a state of affairs where the, the, uh, the listener, the, the observer, is ready to hear what you're about to tell them. So you have to prioritize what you're going to tell them. And uh, that's an individual process. That's that's one on one. So one of the things you could do in their case, for example, I would anyway see it as, wouldn't it be awesome to take your movie off the screen and wrap it around the person? I totally right? agree that with you. That would be a way yeah. of saying, and he might go, wow, cool. Security, unfortunately, most people don't act until something big happens. So Presbyterian Hospital getting held hostage has right. been big for our business. And I tell people, fear, uncertainty, and doubt is one of the reasons why people buy things. We get accused of selling using fear, uncertainty, right, and doubt right. all the time. And my way of countering that is saying, I'm fearful, uncertain, and doubtful every day because the world of security changes. And we have to get it right every day, and the bad guys only have to get it right once. So all I'm here to do is help you to prevent that one it's, time. It's interesting. So the three of you come from an industry that's more reactionary. We're coming from an industry that's aspirational because it doesn't exist yet. You know, right. so people are wondering, oh, what could I do with this? So we, we get a little bit more fun, frankly. We're not dealing with you know people who've been hurt, but people who are then whose imaginations are activated by what they see. Now I've seen some of your demos, and they're pretty cool. I mean, it's really neat to be rowing down the Colorado River, and it's. I think there's so many applications. Would you? Um, uh, would you use those applications in like a, a certain settings? Would it be more appropriate like maybe in a school setting or some kind of experiential learning? So it, it all comes back down to that influence word, right? So we've actually had interest on a number of different uh, partners parts, uh, healthcare, retail, and others. They really want to understand how do we engage people within these environments. And so that's right. the, the question we're trying to answer. All right, so I'm going to let each of you come up with one to two, well, one or two things that you're going to share with a prospective entrepreneur who's pitching an angel or an early stage VC, or even somebody that's in a mature business that has a very complex technology. What advice would you guys give them? Kieran, want to start? Understand the person first. 
I really ask them questions about themselves, their appetite, their interests, get to know them as a person first. Don't just see them as money. So that will also engender trust because you, whether you so, won't be selling, you'll be making them the center. And raising money is probably the closest thing to running a political campaign that you'll ever do. I'm not even <laughs> going there tonight. I mean, it's not going to happen. But All they're right. buying you yeah. at the end of the day. Fair, we can talk about that in a virtual sure, reality absolutely. setting on the next right, show. Right. All right, Ross? So I think that it's, uh, if you got an opportunity to tell them something that they'll get a wow effect from them. And we, we have a product that um, a lot of people want to hear what does that we do that in their, the size of the industry. So would you like to hear about a product in, there's a $5 billion market in cyber weapons. And a lot of people say, well, that's very interesting. Uh, so that, that's good conversation starter and that, you know, I would see if you can find oh, something that you can say something like that. We have, a f we have a cyber weapon that can nail the bad guy would be a good start. That would be great. Yeah, I can buy that. There was a James Bond movie like that where they used to send a spike. Mm -hmm. I remember that one. That was cool. So that's your stuff. Okay, good. Okay. And Gary? I think you really have to understand who you're trying to market to. I think a lot of times people go out and they don't totally know who their customer is. Mm -hmm. They look at the sizes of all these markets, but even these big markets, they're very stratified. They're not all made up of the same individual. Good point. And you really need to define how you're going to take that and break it into smaller groups. Okay. Kevin, you want to sum it? Sure. I think um, making sure that people understand, there's an old saying that says people don't want to know what you have to say until they know that you care. And so part of what I like to do is to get some sort of rapport going with that person on a legitimate level, especially in the high-end network and security business, because generally people that are dealing with us in security are either afraid of something happening or have just suffered something very bad. And some of these things, you know, the breaches are entity killing. Business People go out of business, they get sued and so on. So uh, for me, it, it really comes down to understanding where they are in that process and helping to pull them back out of the fear and the uncertainty and give them the advice that they need to not make mistakes, I yeah. think is really what it comes That's to. That's fair. So what we've heard today is basically understand your customer before you're trying to pitch them or sell them on a product or ask them for funding. The ability to understand the customer, the ability to explain technology in a simple way, and the ability to engender trust is what our panelists have said will make the sale of a complex technology or a complex product much more simple. Hey, I, I thank you all from being on, for being on this panel. And this is David Friedman signing off for Eye on Business. Have a good night.